Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I just will go over a couple housekeeping topics. Um, first, let everybody know this, this event is rec being recorded and we will send it out later. Um, we ask that everyone use the chat box to communicate with our team any troubleshoot issues you may have. And then um, question and answers can be placed in the Q&A box and our team will moderate those. Thank you for being here. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Michael McKee. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm delighted all of you guys can join us for the M Disability Provider Series webinars. And I'm thrilled we have uh, two presenters coming today and uh, gonna be sharing really insightful perspectives, uh, personal experiences with their uh, daughter and sister collectively. Um, so Dr. Amo Oatman is a practicing family physician and assistant professor of family medicine, geriatric medicine and obesity management at the University of Michigan. However, for this webinar, she will be speaking from her personal experience navigating complex systems of care as a mother of a child living with Rett syndrome. Her son, Mohammed Othman, is a biomedical engineering student on the pre-med path at the Wayne State University's Urban D. Reed Honors College. He is passionate about disability advocacy and improving the quality of life for individuals with a disability. During high school, he worked on a project titled The Effects of Communication on Activity Participation and Engagement with the Girl with uh, Rest Syndrome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Thank Dr. you very Dr. much for having us today. It's a pleasure and honor to mm -hmm. be here. Uh, it took me actually many years to have the courage to come and present this topic. And I feel a little bit empowered today having Mohammed with me to help me with this presentation. I will start with sharing the screen here. I hope you can see this one. Yes, oh. we can see it. Okay. So um, we have no financial disclosure. We are here to um, increase awareness and share our personal and uh, professional experience about uh, cognitive disability and specifically Rett syndrome. Uh, we will share some photos during this present presentation. Uh, I think people will remember the photos more than anything else. Our agenda for today, we will have introduction, Red syndrome awareness. Then we will talk about navigating healthcare system, community and school system. And we will help physicians and families with some tips. And I will let Mohammed take the lead on the first part of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Othman. Now to start, I'd like to talk about, you know, what is cognitive impairment? Cognitive impairment is when a person has trouble remembering, learning new things, concentrating, or making decisions that affect their everyday life. These can range from mild to severe. Mild impairment is when there are changes in cognitive functions, but the individual is still able to do everyday activities. Severe impairment is a functional impairment that prevents individuals from living independently. However, when talking about children, there are other terminologies that we use more commonly. These include global developmental delay, which is the preferred term to describe intellectual and adaptive impairment in infants and young children below the age of five, who fail to meet expected developmental milestones in multiple areas of functioning. There are also intellectual disabilities, which are neurodevelopmental disorders that begin in childhood and are characterized by limitations in both intelligence and adaptive skills, affecting at least one of three adaptive domains, conceptual, social, or practical, with varying severity. If severe enough, they can be diagnosed by the age of two. Intellectual disabilities can be divided into two categories, syndromic and non-syndromic. The term, the term syndromic is applied when intellectual and adaptive impairment occurs with other physical or comorbid symptoms that may be recognizable as a symptom, as a syndrome. While non-syndromic refers to an intellectual disability that is present without additional physical, neurological, or metabolic abnormalities. So how common is cognitive impairment? 
Well, global developmental delay has an estimated prevalence between one and 3%, while intellectual disabilities have a prevalence of approximately 1%, with most cases being mild. Intellectual disabilities in children are commonly associated with developmental and mental health disorders, as well as medical and physical conditions. The developmental and mental health disorders that are commonly associated with intellectual disabilities are autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, depressive and anxiety disorders, eating and feeding disorders, learning disorders, movement disorders, PTSD, self-injurious behavior, and substance abuse. The medical and physical conditions that are commonly associated with intellectual disabilities are cerebral palsy and other motor impairments, congenital heart defects, dental caries, endocrine abnormalities, GERD, obesity, seizures, sleep disorders, hearing impairment, and vision impairment. Studies have shown that individuals with intellectual disabilities engage in less physical activity, and as a result, they experience significant health disparities. There is also an increased prevalence of, in of physical and mental health conditions in individuals with intellectual disabilities. Now I'd like to move on to the next topic on our agenda, which is spreading awareness about Rett syndrome. And this is the perfect time to talk about it as October, which is Rett syndrome awareness month, is coming up soon. First, I would like to introduce my sister Noor. She is 16 years old, has Rett syndrome, and is the hero of today's presentation. So what is Rett syndrome? Rett syndrome is a neurodevelopmental disorder that occurs almost exclusively in females. Individuals affected with Rett syndrome initially develop normally, but begin to show the symptoms around the age of 18 months old and have no specific features at birth. Rett syndrome is classified as a rare disease. It affects one in 10,000 to 20,000 females by the age of 12, with 15,000 cases in the US and 350,000 cases worldwide. It occurs in all ethnic and racial groups at similar rates, and around 1,000 girls are diagnosed with it every year. In Michigan alone, there are less than 200 girls with Rett syndrome. And Rett syndrome is actually very rare in boys, with one in one million boys being affected by it. So what causes Rett syndrome? Rett syndrome is caused by a sporadic de novo mutation in the MECP2 gene, a mutation almost exclusively of paternal origin, which may explain the high female to male ratio of Rett syndrome. Because they only have one X chromosome, boys with Rett syndrome are unlikely to survive past early childhood. However, with aggressive medical intervention and dedicated families, they can make it to late childhood with medical complications. In rare familial cases, the mother is, was either a carrier or a mosaic for the mutation. Unfortunately, the cause of this mutation is still unknown, and girls with Rett syndrome have a 70% chance of surviving until the age of 50. Now, in order to diagnose Rett syndrome, both the clinical features and genetic testing are needed because the MECP2 gene mutations can also cause other syndromes. Individuals with Rett syndrome do begin to develop normally. It isn't until around 18 to 24 months of age that they begin a period of regression with loss of speech and purposeful hand movement, gay abnormalities, and stereotypic hand movements. Other symptoms they may develop include breathing problems, irritability and crying, dystonia, sleep disturbances, seizures, scoliosis, unusual eye movements, irregular heartbeat, and dysphagia. Rett syndrome occurs in four main stages. The early onset phase, which occurs between six to 18 months. The rapid destructive phase, a phase of rapid deterioration or regression between the ages of one and four years old. Purposeful hand movement and speech are the first skills lost and Rett syndrome in this phase can be mistaken for autism. After that is the plateau phase, a pseudo stationary phase between the ages of two and 10 years old. Most individuals with Rett syndrome spend most of their life in this stage. And finally, there's the late motor deterioration phase, which is usually complicated with immobility and scoliosis that may require surgery. These pictures show Noor's initial development up to two years old, including social interactions, smiling and laughing, sitting up, standing, playing with siblings, holding objects, and throwing a ball. 
The primary diagnostic criteria for Rett syndrome is the hand stereotypies, which tends to be continuous and includes mouthing, mainly midline, and can involve the use of objects. It may precede the loss of hand functions and appear to evolve over time. I would like to share with you some of Noor's pictures, which show the consistency of the hand stereotypies as a cl classic diagnostic criteria for Rett syndrome. These hand stereotypies are one of the reasons that Dr. Andreas Rett, the Austrian physician who first discovered Rett syndrome, was able to identify it. He saw two girls making the same repetitive hand washing motions, and when he compared their clinical and developmental histories, found that they were very similar. Now, Rett syndrome does have two main types. Classic Rett syndrome is the more common type that typically develops in four stages. And atypical Rett syndrome is less common and has five known variants. Now, Rett syndrome is not a neurodegenerative disorder. Rather, it is a neurodevelopmental disorder with multi-system symptom evolution over the lifespan. And Dr. Othman will continue to explain this in further detail. Thank you very much, Mohammed, for that introduction. Um, this statement is actually very important because when we had the diagnosis in 2009, Rett syndrome was just removed from the autism spectrum and became on the neurodegenerative disorder. And that was actually a very depressing diagnosis at that time, because basically all I was able to find on up to date on that time, half a page telling me that we are losing mobility and speech followed by seizure arrhythmias, all kinds of problems. In conclusion, you know, it meant that we're going to just watch her dying slowly over time. However, you know, with more research, they started to have better understanding of the condition, and they thought it's actually more neurodevelopmental disorder. With neurodevelopmental disorder, you may actually expect relatively stable cognitive performance at some point. And with better understanding, we found out that it's not degenerative. It's not like we're losing brain cells. Brain cells are not dying. What happened that this mutation in the MIG-P2 gene resulted in inability to produce the MIG-P2 protein that is important for synaptic conduction. So we have brain centers that are not able to communicate with each other. And this is where the dysregulation start to happen at the age of two when the body needs more of this protein. The good news that in basic research, they were able to reverse the symptoms in mice model by providing the protein. However, it's really more complicated when it comes to human being. It was still promising and changed our mind about Rett syndrome. Now, is it truly an intellectual disability? Our IQ is actually measured by a standardized test and part of the test is verbal communication and comprehension. These girls lose their ability to communicate verbally at early life at the age of two, but at the same time, they also lose their ability to use their hands so they cannot learn sign language, they cannot use pics, which is like choosing pictures with hand. They cannot write or type or even pointing to objects. So they are lugged in their body. Many of these girls develop screaming as a language, which is really amazing to watch because they really develop different tones. Once you get used to them, you understand they are trying to communicate. It's just not socially acceptable and it's very hard to deal with. One of the most effective means of communication for individuals with Rett syndrome is actually the eye gaze. Using eye gaze communication devices allow them to control screen using their eyes. And this is how it looks like. Basically, they have a screen that calibrates with their eyes. And now they have control on the screen. They can ask to eat or have a snack or use the toilet, uh, you know, she can go to her book library and choose her favorite book. And as soon as she focuses her eyes on the text, the book is reading loudly for her. Then she has to look at different spots to flip the pages and go through it. So there are ways to communicate through their eyes, not traditional thing, not well known in the medical society, but it's the most effective method. 
Physical challenges with Rett syndrome also come early in life. They lose both fine and gross motor skills, which leave them dependent in all activity of daily livings. They cannot feed themselves, they cannot use utensils, they cannot grip on objects, they cannot use a toilet. Um, other challenges is kind of like scoliosis, which can be very aggressive in Rett syndrome. They can actually have 90 degrees scoliosis within just one year. And that's why many of them require surgery to fix it. On top of that, they have the dystonia, muscle contracture, ataxia, all affect the balance and gait. In the past, there was really not much to tell us what to do and what to expect. Losing mobility was kind of like part of the syndrome. More than 50% of girls become, um, you know, uh, they lose their mobility and become wheelchair bound. So it was kind of like acceptable part of the syndrome. Um, there was not much data when we had the diagnosis to guide us what to do. Later, we start to see studies about like walking on treadmill machine and how that can not only improve mobility, but also can improve automatic, autonomic dysfunction, uh, automatic, uh, I'm sorry, autonomic nervous system function. We were lucky that our first physical therapist, when Noor lost her mobility, just put her on a treadmill machine, held her from her underarm and said, let's train her legs again. And we took this by heart because there was no other option. We started to do this every single day for 13 years. And over the time, we found that she was actually able to walk again. And we start to kind of like loosen our hand around here, stand by, sit by for safety. There was lots of physical therapy, lots of bracing, hydrotherapy, whatever it takes to keep this mobility going. We invested a lot of time in that. For many years, we were actually locked in this wheelchair. We couldn't leave the house without it because of the loss of balance. But at some point, we were able to, talk, to take walks in the community and enjoy nice walks uh, outside, which was completely different quality of life. We still need the wheelchair because she gets tired and exhausted fast, but it was promising that you can retrain this pathway and regain mobility. Social challenges with Rett syndrome, another part that can uh, compromise quality of life. Imagine a smart child who's logged in a body that cannot communicate with the external world. A lot of anxiety, a lot of sensitivity to loud and crowded you know, environment, which result in behavior dysregulation, repetitive rocking, screaming, stereotypical arm movement, and sometimes self-injury you know, injury behavior. Sleep disorder is actually big problem in Rett syndrome. These girls don't sleep. They wake up four or five o'clock in the morning like a clock. They have a hard time falling asleep. And when they sleep, they wake up two, three times in the middle of the night full of energy and ready to go at two o'clock in the morning. Lots of agitation, lots of anxiety. I really wanted to give the best picture to primary care physician to what this means without putting like a disruptive you know, video in this presentation. And finally, a mom posted last week on the Facebook a statement that I felt to give a nice conclusion. I'm gonna share her own words. Imagine the impulsivity, anger, and immaturity of a two-year-old tantrum in the body of a 20-year-old girl. With this, she posted a picture of her daughter, bathroom and bedroom. She covered all the walls with layers of foam to try to minimize the damage and the injuries that can happen during these episodes. And this is just one picture of it. Other medical challenges with Rett syndrome, constipation is actually a very common problem and most of these girls require very good regimen for bowel movement, including medications. Uh, GERD can be very disruptive and cause of uh, agitation. Unfortunately, more than 50% develop dysphagia and end up having the G-tube to maintain their nutrition and weight. Seizures 
as common as 70 to 90% at any stage of life. Bradykinesia and rigidity is also common and scoliosis is very common. So imagine the symptoms of autism, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, epilepsy, and an anxiety disorder all together in just one little body. Unfortunately, there is no cure yet for Rett syndrome. However, the basic research studies were actually very promising that we can at some point find the cure. The Rett syndrome natural history study was one of the largest studies that ran for 15 years or more. She, they had more than 1,000 girls. My daughter was one of them. We seek their help when she was four. And they were a huge resource for us to understand what we are dealing with and what to expect and how to navigate the health system and the school system. Out of the study, they developed multiple clinical trials. One of them was the trophinotide, which another study that we had the honor to participate in in 2016. And now they are going through the final FDA approval process, which can happen any time this fall. This medicine is targeting some of the symptoms associated with Rett syndrome. Cell gene therapy is actually the future hope for cure. These are just like the clinical trials that are going on at different stages, everyone trying to target you know, different symptoms. We started the first clinical gene therapy trial a couple of months ago in Canada. There are lots of theories, you know, should we block this gene? Should we replace this gene? Should we actually edit the gene? Or try just to give the deficient protein and figure out how to regulate it inside the body. Lots of promising ideas and lots of work from the research group in, you know, in red. Um, syndrome. So we are navigating the world with Rett syndrome. Let's start with the health system. We cannot talk about healthcare system without talking about implicit bias and healthcare disparities. Many studies showing that even when we do our best and we don't think that we have bias, fortunately, the majority of us are biased. I had firsthand experience with implicit bias when I started to navigate the health system with NOR at the age of one. And it was very clear that every time we go to see a specialist, they looking at her dad and assume the mother does not speak English. Until, you know, her hus my husband look at me and ask me to answer the questions. And I get this moment of, uh, do you have medical background? Unfortunately, over time, I realized that quitting my career to take care of hair is not an option. I felt way more empowered being the physician mom than being just the mom, even when I wanted to be the mom. Parents with children with intellectual disability, they really kind of like struggle with the lack of knowledge among health professionals, whether they are misdiagnosed or their concern were underestimated or dismissed. The lack of treatment or cure by itself is really frustrating. The lack of resources, when we had the diagnosis, we had no ABA therapist where like, you know, within one hour drive in all direction. There was no insurance coverage at that time. And by the time they had the insurance coverage, we were above the age for it and we had still to private pay for that. Imagine when you try to restore function or try to prevent the loss of function and you have limitation on the number of PT or OT sessions that you have for your child. So you have to choose mid-year if you're gonna continue paying out of bucket or you're gonna let go and watch your, your child decline. I want to stop and remind healthcare physicians and providers about the stages of grief. When any individual has a bad diagnosis, they go through the cycle of accepting the unacceptable. These stages don't have to be in a specific order. Everybody is different. And even the length of every stage can be different. But I'm going to talk about 
the bargaining stage. This is actually a defense mechanism. When you try really to avoid the sense of loss and push the grief away, you try to find alternative treatment, try to hold to any light that you may actually have treatment for your child or cure, even if there's 1% chance. What if the 1% is my child? This is how many parents feel at some point when they go through this. As a physician who like spent years and years in evidence-based medicine, knowing that there is no cure for my daughter and going on the internet trying to find other resources, what we are missing here, that's exactly how it felt. Lost in the space. Seeing all these small lights and hoping that if you reach to them, they can lead to a bigger one and help you bringing your child back. Many, many, many non-evidence-based treatment outside. There's really nobody investing in any of them to tell us, you know, how effective they are, you know, what harm they can cause. But parents try to seek anything and everything to try to save their children. And, you know, many of them will not share with their, you know, physicians what they're trying because they don't want to be judged. This is actually how it looked like when you try to navigate the healthcare system with Rett syndrome. Primary care physician is really the center, you know, of all this, the coordinator, the one that should coordinate the care for everybody. And these are the specialists that usually a child with Rett syndrome will have to see over the years. Luckily, we had our first primary care guidelines published in 2020, which was blessing. Very nice, well-organized guidelines for physicians and therapists. And I will just go over some of the recommendations here. Individuals with Rett syndrome should be seen on regular wellness checkup for screening and immunization. Extra time should be provided to ensure, you know, inspecting the individual without braces or shoes or out, you know, clo out, outer clothing. Parents should actually track all the record of, you know, um, specialists and testing that they are doing. Now with the EMR, I think it's kind of less hectic to keep things in one place. During the annual wellness, the child should have. Uh, his hair vitals documented, including head circumference, tenor stage, and developmental milestone. We should screen for nutrition, constipation, GERD, dysphagia. We should screen for breathing, hold, breath holding, and hyperventilation. We should screen for scoliosis, joint mobility, and contracture. We should screen for movement, tones, and paroxysmal events that can mimic seizures. We should look for pressure ulcers if they are wheelchair bound, bound and skin breakdown from the hand stereotype movement. We should screen for sleep disorder and anxiety and other behavior concerns. If there is urine retention, we should screen for UTI. And if there is recurrent UTI, they should be referred to urologist. We should screen for poor circulation. Many of these girls have cold hand and feet all summer and mottled legs because of the autonomic dysfunction. Screen for vision concern and screen for communication method by family and school and document them in the chart. Review available community and insurance resources and screen for caregiver burnout. Girls with Rett syndrome should have annual labs, including CBC, electrolyte panel, vitamin D, and fasting lipid. They should have annual EKG to screen for prolonged QTC, and sh we should avoid actually medication that can cause prolonged QTC, even if it is not there on the EKG. Routine dental care, please advise no anesthesia at the dental office. It should be done in the, in the OR with an anesthesiologist in the room. Spine x-ray at baseline, and if there is scoliosis, it should be repeated every six months. And if there is more than 20 degrees, it should be referred to orthopedic. So going back to this, and just remind, you know, 
there are some things that we can treat in primary care. If you're not comfortable, it's time to move on and get the specialist on board. Tips for healthcare professionals. Treat with compassion and empathy. Be kind. Acknowledge that there is no way you know everything about more than 10,000 rare disease in the world. Listen, learn, and partner with parents. I will tell you there is no way you invest the time and effort that parents put to learn about their loved one condition. They can give you a lot of conclusions and save your time. You just need to confirm some of these information through society guidelines and trustful resources. Allow access to specialists and have open discussion about complementary treatment and guide them to appropriate resources. We are now lucky to have many, many board certified integrative medicine physicians who have the combination of like knowledge and evidence-based, you know, complementary medicine. So let's use them because it fulfills something inside the heart of parents at some point. And we all agree that do not do harm. Caring for individuals in healthcare system. I had this question before. So when they are admitted in the hospital, how to take care of them? I'm a geriatrician. I took care of older adult with dementia and delirium for years in hospital setting. And I will tell you, I learned a lot from older adults that helped me taking care of my daughter. And I learned it from my daughter, many things that helped me taking care of older adults. One of the important thing in hospital setting really to support and encourage the presence of the caregiver. Nobody will know the body language of individuals with intellectual disability than their own caregiver. Ask about alternative method of communication. We're not talking about language. It's not a language here. We're talking about communication method. Are they using pictures to choose? Are they using, you know, tablet, you know, communication device, sign language, whatever communication method, please try to acknowledge this in the chart. Ask about preferred movie or song or games. It's not enough just to turn the TV on. It's not enough just to turn the you know, Disney Channel on. It's not any Barbie movie. It's actually specific Barbie movie that can make the experience completely different for this girl. So these details can make a huge difference in their experience sitting in a hospital you know, a bed. Ask about normal routine, like meal time, nabs, bowel movement. Pulling on the line or the IV line or hitting a nurse can be their way to say, I need to use a bathroom. Addressing issues that can lead to disruptive behavior. Pain. If there is any reason the child can be in pain, recent trauma, she has her period, you know, she has chronic pain to start with, use a scheduled regimen. She's not going to tell you she's in pain. She's going to scream. She's going to kick. She's going to pull things. She's going to throw things around because she's trying to tell you she's in pain. So put a good pain regimen and assess every 24 hours. Have a bowel regimen, screen for urine retention. Try to mimic sleep cycle if they have one and avoid really unnecessary blood work and disruption. I believe palliative care support should be in every hospital system. If we don't have it, we should actually have them to help the team taking care of these individuals. Now, navigating the community is another part on our agenda. Unfortunately, you know, social determinants of health play kind of like rule and in how individuals can navigate the community. Studies showed that children from low socioeconomic household with a history of poverty and neglect are more likely to be diagnosed with cognitive disability. And on top of being more likely to have the disability, low-income families struggle to provide necessary care for these individuals. You add to that community resources itself. Many of those you know, with cognitive disability become isolated due to the lack of meaningful opportunity to participate in the society. 
and there's lack of awareness about cognitive disability that result in lack of inclusive accommodation for these individuals that allow them to participate. Families with children with intellectual disability have different thought process when they actually access the community. It's not just like, let's go eat outside. There are lots of details we have to consider when we you know, think about these outlets. Uh, for example, dining out, you know, we prefer 3 to 5 p.m. It's not lunch, it's not dinner, it's less crowded, no noise, so less stimulation. Um, local events versus out of state, completely different planning. Long car rides, you know, we try to avoid uh, straining on the back, worsening scoliosis. Also, car rides usually increase stereotype, rocking movement and anxiety. Flight and anxiety, that's a whole topic by itself, navigating airport security and access to bathrooms on a flight. Lodging, you know, should we choose hotels versus vacation rentals? You know, when you have a child waking up three, four times in the middle of the night screaming, you know, like you don't want to wake everybody at the hotel. And crowdness, you know, like if we go into a social event, do we have outlet of things get back bad, you know, and this regulated behavior kicks in? Um, a lot of consideration to things that people don't usually think about. But it's still, it's very important to allow those individuals to be part of the community and include them. It's important to improve their function, to improve their well being, to allow them at some point to have like employment or be part of recreational and living environment in the community. We try to take the chance whenever possible, as you see big smile on the face whenever we are outside, doesn't matter water or land. And, you know, we try to learn from every experience for the next one. This year we made it to Disney in a spring break. It was a successful trip with all awesome accommodation for disability. We still had to leave some times, you know, early. We had, you know, to stay at home some days, but at the end, we all had fun. And this beautiful girl made it to Pandora. Navigating the school system. This can be part-time or full-time job for some parents. And unfortunately, I think there's some dissociation between the health system and school system. We think that these individuals go to a special ed education, that's it. You know, we don't really hear a lot of details after that. But let's understand our school system here. By law, all these children should go to school and be accommodated. And we have more than 6 million children with disabilities receive special ed and related service in our schools each year. We have the early intervention, which is a system of service designed to help infants and toddlers with disability. Usually it starts by referral from the pediatrician or the family reaching out to local hospital or, or health department for resources and information, or even reaching directly through the internet to these agencies. Staff worker will actually come out to the family make assessment and if the child meets the requirement uh, or the criteria for the service, they provide the service at home. Once the child is three, now we're moving to special ed. Special ed is available free of charge to every eligible child with disability, including preschoolers from three to 21. These services are especially designed to address the child individual needs associated with the disability. School staff usually work with parents to develop what we call individualized education program, IEP. Now, especially it is not just trying to include them in general ed and teaching them reading and writing and basic math. It's also important to teach adaptive skills. And that requires teachers who have special expertise in working with these children and have additional peer staff to help you know, the teacher achieving these goals, beside the therapist, ET, OT, and speech. 
every child has his own different goals. For example, with Rett syndrome, improving communication with others, you know, through her device, that's important goal. Taking care of personal needs, trying to teach how to use the bathroom, washing hands, how to do simple chores if possible, safety, uh, social skills, how to sit and get along in a group and play a game. Uh, function analysis of behavior problem and trying to understand triggers for the behavior. Hopefully we can avoid it in the future. And when they get older, they hope to teach them some skills that can help them in a workplace. However, it's not a smooth process, you know, all the time. Even though schools, I think they try to do their best meeting, you know, uh, the parent expectation. But unfortunately, sometimes they don't reach agreement. And you will see, you know, like in, in on social media, parents using the word, I've been fighting, I've been fighting, I've been fighting, because it really feels like you are fighting for your child right all the time. One of the main problems in this situation, sometimes the lack of knowledge about the condition that can lead to setting unreasonable goals. I will give two examples, you know, with Red Syndrome. If she's walking, doesn't mean that she doesn't need physical therapy. Because when we stop the physical therapy, this is when we're going to start to see the decline. So we cannot say if she's walking, she doesn't need physical therapy. We're actually doing the physical therapy every day as part of our routine. Another example, when Noor was five, this is when I learned it from the natural history study about the communication devices. I came back so excited about it. Like, I found it, you know, I know now how to teach her to communicate with me. And I went to the school and I showed them the pictures of the device. And they looked at me and said, oh, she's not ready for that yet. I was like, what do you mean she's not ready? We have been working on traditional speech therapy for four, three years now, and she's not making any progress. And they insisted that she's not ready. And unfortunately, this is when you know, social determinant of health will show up again. And I had to hire my own speech therapist, behavior therapist to teach her how to use these devices. Went through a whole process of like speech pathology eval, letters from neurologists to come back to the school and say, this is actually the ideal, you know, way to communicate with a girl with Red syndrome. And this is how her IEP should be. That's exhausting. That's really exhausting and should not be this way. And, you know, the funny is, is not like my daughter was not ready. The funny thing was that the school actually did not have the expertise to train her. Luckily, now we are in a beautiful school system in the area where she and multiple other colleagues for her in the classroom using different devices. And the school teachers and therapists all have higher expertise in this area. But unfortunately, that's not the, you know, the situation everywhere. So many parents have to go through this kind of like fight. And as primary care physician, we should actually be able to provide some letters based on the child condition to support their situation and give them the service they need in the school. When things really cannot reach you know, consensus. This is when the parents have to go higher up and start search for advocacy you know, agencies or you know, other resources to try to get their you know, kids the therapy that they think should you know, be on their IEP. Now, moving to another area, effect of intellectual disability on families and siblings. It was really interesting because there are mixed results, you know, between studies. Some of them depends on like the perception of the parents versus the uh, perception of the sibling. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, showed like several variables that can affect family quality of life. And there was combination of benefits and challenges in some of the studies. One study showed that siblings of individuals with cognitive disabilities had greater cognitive empathy than others. And I can relate to this study. I saw it all. I think that was actually the good aspect of Red Syndrome in our life. I was so proud of Mohammed when he chose to have his senior project in high school. 
as working on effective the effect of communication on activity participation and engagement in a girl with red syndrome and he worked with his sister to engage her in some of the social activity that she, she cannot do with her hands to do it with her eyes i found this among my papers that i collected over the years uh, when i was preparing for this presentation and i thought it will be nice to leave it here for every parent who have a child with intellectual disability. And I would like to tell every parent, learn about your child disability and be the expert. Educate others about your child disability, whether they are healthcare providers, schools, your community, be patient, be hopeful, Find out what skills your child is learning and try to empower them. Find opportunities for your child, you know, in the community for social activities. Connect with other parents whose children have similar disability. That's a huge resource by itself. I cannot see enough about the power of social media and how it can be very helpful uh, to find resources through them. Meet with the school and develop IEP to address your child needs. Be your child the advocate. And I can say this statement a thousand times. Take pleasure in your beautiful one. Noor just turned 16 in August. And I will tell you, we learned over the years the language of eyes. This is kind of the language that is not written in any book. These are some of the references we had for this talk. And I want to say thank you very much for listening to us today. I would like to say thank you for my wonderful, supportive husband and father. Without him, the journey would have been way, way harder. Uh, thanks for supportive sibling that been there for their sister all the time. Thanks for wonderful supportive caregivers that were part of our life and allowed us to balance our fights and navigation to the whole world. And thank you for supportive family and community who allowed us to be part of their life, never judged us and allowed us to um, enjoy our life with them without fe feeling being judged. And I will finish the talk with this beautiful smile. And I think we have some time for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, this has really been incredibly insightful. Um, you know, again, like you've alluded, it's impossible for us to know everything about all of these uh, different conditions, including rare diseases. Um, there, I want to open it up uh, for questions. I know many of us um, want to do more, want to be able to be an advocate and help. Um, I know Dr. Sasso has posted a question. Um, so there's one in the chat, which I think it's a great question to open up. And I do have a, um, another question that I wanted to throw out that I'm sure many of us are wondering about is how can we better advocate for you, especially um, you talk about like school, IEP, uh, sometimes I get requests for parents to write a letter. Um, so if you could just mention uh, what were successful advocacy on uh, from a healthcare team, um, hopefully there is examples of that as well. So I'll stop there and uh, let you go ahead and start with that first question. Thank you so much. Yeah, so like one of the challenges we had when she started to develop the scoliosis was actually the ride on the bus that was a little bit too long. And, you know, she doesn't have a good support on her, you know, in her chair. So we requested to have like at least some support and trying to keep her the last on, you know, the right. Of course, you know, that you requested this, but doesn't really go through that easy. You end up having a letter from uh, the primary care physician, physical medicine and rehab to support the case. And I think the school has actually more respect to the parents request when they have like some medical letters to support their case. Um, other situations, you know, with the school, really kind of like talking with the teacher and trying to understand the barrier for the care. Uh, we have to acknowledge that everybody's understaffed nowadays and schools are not 
better than any other place. So sometimes it's kind of like a collaborative work between family and the school trying to figure out what resources the school can provide and what resources the family can help with to kind of provide the, the better care for the child. Uh, so it really kind of like depends on what is going on, but understanding the condition at least will be important. And I will tell you like in every primary care setting, you don't have thousands of rare conditions. You have few children on your panel that have these, you know, rare condition. So it's not overwhelming to try to learn about some of them, especially if there's specific concern from the parents. Now, there was another question from Dr. Zazov about community support groups for parents with children with intellectual disability, those low socioeconomic groups. Most of the society try to get together for some activities. Um, and I think like every community try to do you know, something on their own, but it's not really kind of like organized on a higher level. Uh, it's still sad that if you really don't have the resources, you can be very, very isolated. And Red syndrome is really exhausting condition, you know, like you have the physical and the mental kind of like part of it. And, you know, with COVID, like finding caregivers been very, very difficult. So lots of families struggled with really finding the help. Many parents had to quit their job to take care of their beloved one because they are one to one. Uh, so I feel like it has to come from a higher level, you know, like a higher community level, like not enough to just be on individual, you know, level or small organizations. And hopefully by increasing the awareness, we are kind of like telling them we really need more resources in the community. School are focused on academic, particularly reading rather than the whole child. How did you navigate the expectation and realism? Well, you know, it really kind of like depends. So there are like two types of special ed. There are children who have partial integration and general ed with their special ed education. So they are getting the service, but during like some classes, they can join general ed for education. And this is where like the academic focus become more important with more kind of like disability, you start to actually focus on the adaptive skills over the academic. So it's a little bit kind of like a balance, but again, you know, I think requesting the IEB meeting to address these kind of like goals and make sure that your goals in alignment with what the school actually doing and they have as goals for your child is very, very important. And again, most of the times actually the parents who are the one pushing for more academics and more stuff, I feel like my experience, my personal experience, I feel like the school actually usually lower the expectation from the child and that's not right because these children have a lot inside. If we know how to communicate with them, we can get way more you know, uh, out of them. Any other question? There's one additional question, Dr. Marsoff. And I do wanna also add a question for uh, Muhammad as well. Um, so if you can talk about your strategies um, when you're with NOR um, in terms of uh, out in society, um, you know, different activities, you know, obviously um, a lot of people are, you know, uncertain, they may feel awkward or they may ignore, just curious about your strategies to inform and give them uh, better ideas and strategies to be able to engage her directly. Although Noor does get, you know, like really sometimes she gets anxious in very crowded settings, uh, she usually does enjoy like having activities with people. Uh, like if you're playing like a like a board game with her, like, uh, like a matching game, for example, she really loves that. And I mean, there's really like, I don't know how to word this. It's more of, you know, trying to connect with them. You know, it's not about like just, it's not, it's not really a more of like scientific thing. Like how do you, you know, strategically 
you know, help them. It's more of, you know, just try to connect with them, you know, feel like what they, what they enjoy, what they like, you know, so you can really just get a feel for what they feel instead of um, looking at it from a more strategic or medical standpoint. It comes down to the body language again, yeah. like learning the body language of the individual, like what they like. And, and they are so expressive in, in their facial expression. You know, like we, we can tell like if she's really enjoying something versus like she's really anxious and, and want mm -hmm. to leave a place. Uh, and I think we stopped actually thinking what people think about it, right, Muhammad? <laughs> we don't even hear her screaming in the community anymore. There's will... several great questions. Um, Dr. Marsoff and um, also uh, Devin uh, have questions in the uh, the chat box. I don't know if either one of you want to take on that question. Yeah, letters from physician actually to increase PT and OT. I think it's important to like indicate the goal of the PT. Are we try to improve function, maintain function, or regain lost function? Like you know, some insurance want to see some progression. And we have to state clearly, like we're not expecting improvement. We actually trying to maintain the function and prevent the loss of function. So this statement is very important when we talk about PT and OT. Also the progression of these kids is very, very slow. And it depends also on how you approach them. Uh, I, In my personal experience, integration of ABA and PT and OT had way better outcome than just doing traditional PT and OT by itself. How can primary care society support family who caring and advocating for family members? And the ours was screaming that might offer support for family. So key screening, you know, Red syndrome is a little bit challenging because they don't have any specific features when they are young. It, and you know the fact that they have this kind of like normal development in the first 18 to 24 months of life make it a little bit confusing. And you know I, I can see why they get misdiagnosed because the check mark for the list when you talk about autism, yes, they are meeting the criteria. However, you know, when we talk about like considering other parents concern, you'll find something else that tells you that child does not really fit. And we are lucky because we have these genetic testing available now. I know in other countries, they really struggle having these genetic testing to rule out other you know, genetic conditions. But here, at least we have access to that. And we should actually have lower threshold when we look for you know, the whole clinical picture. specific medical emotional support for caregiver that take need advocacy. I agree. We really need more support for caregivers. You know, um, everybody feels like they're going through their own like world and fighting on their own. And unfortunately, that will be different from one, you know, place to another. Like some workplaces are more accommodating and understanding. Some unfortunately don't have this flexibility and force parents to quit their job because there is no flexibility in taking care of their kids. And as you see, this is really unpredictable syndrome. You know, you can have a new problem anytime uh, that you are not even expecting. Just thinking about barriers for family, theater from Canada. I totally agree. Without medical background, I really don't know. Like, you know, it, it was hard for me to navigate the whole system with Red Syndrome to try to understand like what our options and what we can do. And that's why I said the social media has really its own power of sharing these experience and uh, increasing the awareness about options for treatment and resources for family. And luckily we have like, you know, groups for Red Syndrome in Michigan only and Red Syndrome like nationwide and the international Red Syndrome group. So these are actually one of the best resources for family to understand what is going on. Other places available. There are actually uh, 
places that now have EDA and um, I know Livonia has actually one center that offer that private EBA can be a little bit more expensive than centers. Uh, it needs a, a lot of investment of the family and time and effort to apply uh, EBA therapy on a regular basis to actually see some good outcome. As a parent of a child with rare this cause of IDD, I can relate to your experience. Many parents describe falling off the cliff when their child becomes an adult or at the age of 26, when school programs end. How can parents prepare for this future? I will be honest with you. I still try to learn about it. Uh, you know, uh, it's scary. Uh, I appreciate that we have a school system now that's helping us and she loves going to the school. She loves actually getting on the school bus and enjoy her time with her friends. Um, so like the fact that there will be no outlet in the future except to like family resources to get her outside in the community and no other opportunities, uh, very scary. Uh, we're still trying to learn about residential options and what it means. Uh, it's a huge learning curve for parents when they have a child with rare disease. And every stage is its own learning experience, unfortunately. So I want to just um, recognize, I recognize that it's already past one o'clock, so we are going to have to close at this time. I want to just give both of you a, a big thank you for sharing your stories and also uh, just helping us to recognize where we can actually um, hopefully be an advocate for those who have intellectual developmental disabilities and uh, those with uh, rare diseases. So again, thank you. Um, this will be uh, saved as a recording. So if there are others that wanna watch this, uh, we'll be on the, the M Disability website. So I wanna thank um, our captionists, uh, Lana, um, and thank you, Dawn and uh, Bettina for helping to have this um, arranged and set up. So thank you for all the attendees for joining us uh, today. And um, there are a couple of questions if, if um, perhaps we can just respond you know, directly to those who are offline, okay? Thank you again so much. Thank, thank you. you very much for having us. Thank you.